The concept of a nuclear triad, a nuclear deterrent that depends upon three different types of delivery systems, evolved over the course of the 1960s. Each piece of the triad, strategic bombers, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles, have different capabilities that together are intended to ensure a second strike capability that makes a first strike by any nation unthinkable as it would guarantee their own destruction. Of the three, the one that offered the most technological challenges were the submarine-launched ballistic missiles. All the difficulty in creating a ballistic missile becomes even more complex when you look at trying to store and launch those from a moving boat. And 65 years ago, on December 30th, 1959, that leg of the triad took an enormous step forward with the commissioning of the USS George Washington. America's first nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine was so advanced that it changed everything. The Second World War included advances in both submarine technology and missile technology, and both technologies developed rapidly in the post-war environment. Randall Fortson, a historian at the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command, explained in 2021, shortly after World War II, the United States began exploring ways to combine its advances in submarine technology with its rapidly developing missile technology to serve as a deterrent against Soviet aggression. There were certainly Allied attempts to develop guided missiles during the Second World War. The U.S. Army Air Force's Aphrodite program envisioned using radio-guided B-17 bombers as guided bombs to attack hardened targets, and the Navy deployed a guided missile anti-ship bomb called the BAT towards the end of the war. But Germany, which successfully deployed the long-range ballistic V-2 missile, was clearly ahead of Allied efforts and the development of strategic missiles thereafter were highly influenced by the V-2 designs, often developed from captured V-2 rockets themselves, as well as German rocket scientists, whose capture became a priority for both the Allies and the Soviets. The German Navy did have various plans to operate submarines capable of launching V-1 flying bombs or V-2 ballistic missiles. These U-boats could then carry these weapons to within range of attacks on U.S. coastal cities. However, U.S. planners might have overestimated those capabilities, and no operational versions were finished by the war's end. Another opponent, however, had produced a weapon that might have offered that capability. The Japanese I-400 class of submarines were the largest built during the war, and included more than a 100-foot-long waterproof hangar capable of housing three float planes capable of carrying either bombs or a torpedo. Only two of the I-400 class were operational before the end of the war, and neither was able to carry out a large operational strike before the Japanese surrender. The Americans, however, quickly realized that the large hangars on the I-400 class, married with German rocket technology, could allow a submarine to carry and fire large guided missiles. On January 20th, 1948, the U.S. successfully tested the concept, mounting a hangar behind the sail of the Baleo-class submarine USS Cusk and successfully firing a Republic Forward JB-2 Loon missile near copy of the German V-1. The missile was capable of carrying more than 2,000 pounds of explosives with a range of about 150 miles. Missiles launched from Cusk and USS Carbonaro demonstrated that the Navy's anti-aircraft guns were unable to successfully shoot down jet-propelled targets. Fortson writes, Having proved that a submarine could indeed launch a missile at sea, the Navy sought longer-range capabilities. The new answer was the Regulus-1, built by Chance Vought. Although its design was influenced by the V-1 missile, the Regulus was a U.S. Navy design. The radar-guided missile was notably capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. A Regulus missile was successfully fired from USS Tunney in 1953. Five U.S. diesel-powered submarines were modified to carry the missile and operational between 1959 and 1964, the most capable of which was USS Halibut, which was capable of carrying five of the second-generation cruise missiles. But the Regulus had a significant disadvantage, as the submarine had to surface to launch the missile and had remained surfaced for the radio-guided missile control. Due to the limitations, the operation of the Regulus submarines was seen as more of a stopgap than as a long-term solution because during this period the Soviet Union was also producing missile-equipped submarines. Using the R-11FM, described as the first submarine-launched ballistic missile, mounted on NATO-designated Zulu and Gulf-class submarines and deployed beginning in 1956. The missiles were carried inside the submarine, allowing them to be prepared before launch, but the submarine would still have to surface to launch the missiles, which could carry a 2,000-pound payload, some 82 nautical miles. Each submarine carried three missiles. But a new development promised to dramatically increase the capability of ballistic missile submarines. On September 30, 1954, the U.S. commissioned USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered submarine. 
Nuclear propulsion greatly extended the operational range and capabilities of submarines, and the Navy realized that arming nuclear submarines with nuclear missiles essentially created a launch platform that would be virtually undetectable and able to launch from nearly any position in the ocean. Fortson writes that Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Arlie Burke sought a missile that could be launched while a submarine was submerged, as the need to fire from the surface made the submarine vulnerable to attack. The project was assigned to Rear Admiral William Rayburn, Jr., the head of the Navy's Special Project Office. The design would require development both in terms of missiles and warhead technology. Historian Alex Wellerstein explains the challenges with developing submarine-launched ballistic missiles on his nuclear weapons history blog, Restricted Data. The technological risks were high. It would take a lot of money and effort to see if it worked, and if it didn't, you couldn't get that investment back. At one point, a top admiral canceled the entire program, but only after another part of the Navy had sent around solicitations to airspace companies and laboratories for comment. And the comments proved enthusiastic enough that they canceled the cancellation. In the end, though, Wellerstein argues that what drove them to finally push for it was a perception of being left out. The Army and the Air Force were building weapons, and the Navy wanted its share of the pie. Important to the missile design was a solid-fueled rocket. Previous liquid-fueled rockets generally had to have components stored separately, and the rocket would have to be prepared before launch. Worse, the hypergolic fuel components could produce toxic gases or even explosions if exposed to seawater, a problem aboard a submarine. But developments in solid-fuel rocket design offered more promise, as did developments in the warhead. The website of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory explains that in the summer of 1956, a U.S. Navy-sponsored study, Project Nopska, on anti-submarine warfare was held at Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And during a July 18 symposium on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons effects, Livermore's Edward Teller set the laboratory on a new course when he argued that trends in nuclear weapons development would soon lead to warheads with a weight, yield, and size that could fit within conventional torpedo tubes. In particular, Teller stated that a one megaton warhead at a much reduced weight was feasible within five years, a radical concept at the time. Wellerstein writes, other weapon scientists regarded this as possibly dangerous overhyping and overselling of the technology, but the Navy was convinced that they could probably get within the right neighborhood of yield to weight ratios. By the fall of 1956, the Navy had approved a plan to create their own ballistic missile. The Polaris missile program was officially created in December of 1956. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory writes, the assignment originally targeted an initial missile operation date of 1963, with the full capability of 1965. However, on October 4, 1957, history changed when the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, into space. With tensions ratcheted to near public panic levels, Livermore was asked if they could deliver a warhead several years earlier. So began a crash three-year effort to develop an underwater-launched solid-fuel missile system. The name Polaris was a medieval Latin word for heavenly. While the missile was being developed, a new submarine class was also underway. The Skipjack class of hunter-killer submarines were the second class of U.S. nuclear-powered attack submarines, following the Skate class. They used a new teardrop-shaped hull design that had been tested with the research submarine USS Albacore, which maximized underwater speed. With a new imperative for nuclear missile submarines, two submarines of the class being constructed by the Electric Boat Company of Groton, Connecticut, USS Scorpion, already under construction, and USS Sculpin, yet to be laid down, were instead converted to carry Polaris missiles. The missile submarines were similar to the skipjack vessels, but with a 130-foot missile compartment inserted between the ship's control and navigation areas and the nuclear reactor compartment. The space would allow room for 16 missile launch tubes, a capability far beyond Soviet ballistic submarines of the time. They were given the designation SSBN for Ship Submersible Ballistic Nuclear, the nuclear referring to the power plant as opposed to the missiles. The first of the two, originally named USS Scorpion, was redesignated USS George Washington. The Springfield, Massachusetts Daily Morning Union reported on August 2nd, Normally, submarines are named after fish, but with the world conditions as they are, it was decided to name the ballistic missile submarines after great men in American history. Thus, the first of the so-called ultimate weapons is named after the founder of our country. Launched June 9, 1959, the United Press reported the first Polaris missile submarine, USS George Washington, was launched today with the prayerful hope of President Eisenhower that she would never have to unleash her tremendous destructive power against an aggressor nation. The submarine underwent sea trials and was commissioned on December 30th. However, the world's first nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine didn't yet have any missiles. 
A Polaris missile was not successfully launched from the George Washington until July 20, 1960. Still, it was an extraordinary feat. The George Washington began its first patrol with a full complement of 16 missiles on November 15th of the same year. That was, the Federation of American Scientists notes, just four years and 11 months after Rear Admiral William F. Red Rayburn became the director of special projects, and three years, 11 months after the Secretary of Defense authorized the Polaris. Arguably, the Federation writes, it can be considered the submarine that has most influenced world events in the 20th century. With its entry into service in December 1959, the United States instantly gained the most powerful deterrent force imaginable, a stealth platform with enormous nuclear firepower. The United Press noted their exceptional capability. The first of nine fleet ballistic missile subs which will patrol the oceans of the world with all major targets within range of their 1,500-mile two-stage rockets, the George Washington is the second heaviest submersible ever to be built. But there was an issue. The missiles were not exactly working as promised. Wilstein notes, the first generation of Polaris warheads were, to put it mildly, a flop. Not only was the range shorter, 1,200 versus 1,500 miles, meaning that there was really only one place it could be, off the coast of Norway, if it wanted to hit any of the big Soviet cities. Uh, moreover, they were unreliable, with one naval officer telling author Eric Schlosser that the Navy had almost zero confidence that the warhead would work as intended. Wilstein writes, the first generation of Polaris missiles, fielded in 1960, were inaccurate and short-ranged, separate from the fact that the warheads probably wouldn't have worked. This relegated them to a funny strategic position. They could only be used as a counter-value secondary strike. They didn't have the accuracy necessary to destroy hardened targets, and many of those were more centrally located in the USSR. The more capable A-2 version was not tested until May of 1962, and the A-3 not until 1964. Five George Washington-class vessels were commissioned. The last, USS Abraham Lincoln, commissioned in May of 1961. Four more Polaris-carrying fleet ballistic missile submarine classes would follow, with a total of 41 submarines, which the United States called the 41 for Freedom. Mike Billington of the South Florida Sun Sentinel wrote in 1991, Someone dubbed them the 41 for Freedom, and it stuck. It stuck because it was an appropriate nickname for the United States' first ballistic missile submarine fleet, appropriate because it summed up the fleet's mission. Appropriate, too, because it evokes memories of the thin red line of British infantry in the Crimean War and the 300 Spartans who fought the Persians at Thermopylae. 41 for freedom. Not really very many boats upon which to rest the fate of a nation. Eventually armed with the Polaris replacement Trident missiles, the boats helped to define the world's nuclear arsenals. The 1972 SALT-1 Nuclear Limitation Treaty limited the number of submarine-based nuclear missile tubes allowed to the United States to 654. That is the total complement of those 41 submarines. Limitations of the SALT II Treaty and the advent of the Ohio class meant that they had their missiles removed in the 1980s, although many remained in service in other roles. The Benjamin Franklin class USS Kamehameha was used as a platform for Navy SEALs and was not retired until 2002. That last of the original 41 had served nearly 37 years, longer than any other nuclear-powered submarine. In 1981, USS George Washington was involved in a collision with a Japanese cargo vessel, the Nishumaru, causing the Nishumaru to sink. There was a diplomatic row with Japan, both over the cause of the accident and the fact that the USS George Washington, unaware that the Nishumaru had been severely damaged, failed to report the accident. The United States eventually accepted responsibility. In 1983, USS George Washington had her missiles removed, but she continued to serve as an attack submarine until she was decommissioned in 1985. Today, the sale of USS George Washington is on display at the Submarine Force Museum in Groton, Connecticut. The term Boomer, an obvious reference, became popular as a nickname for SSBNs shortly after the commissioning of USS George Washington, and all of the terminology involved, saying that they were a response to Soviet aggression, praying that they be ever ready but never used, and even the odd term 41 for freedom belies the fact that they carried an enormous destructive capability, but the fact remains that there has been no nuclear confrontation since the Boomers went to sea. Billington notes that during the coldest days of the Cold War, these 41 boats provided the baseline of America's nuclear deterrent.
I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 